What is good, Fundamism fam? This is your boy, Paul J. Long, and welcome to the Fundamism Podcast. Super excited about today's guest, but before we introduce him or her, we'll keep you in suspense. Shout out to our sponsor, Charlie Hustle. Go to charliehustle.com to learn more about the threads, the masks, and all the good stuff that they got and they're working with there at Charlie Hustle. CharlieHustle.com to learn more. So you guys know the deal. Welcome to the podcast. This is where we shed light on all the things that give us strength and we showcase people that are doing fun things and gravitating towards the things that make them smile. So uh, a little new introduction. And now. Introducing first to the Fundamism Podcast, coming in at seven foot, 255 pounds, playing center out of Wichita State University, your very own Garrett Stutz. What's good, Stutzy? Man, just happy to be alive another day. Happy to be talking. <laughs> happy to be alive uh i know you say that tongue-in-cheek because you've had a couple of brushes with death we'll talk about that before we get into uh you and all things fun uh let's talk a little bit about what specifically you do for fun that is a long list uh first of all like most people love to golf that's one of my things i just enjoy doing not very good at it anymore. Don't get to play it nearly as consistently as I would like to. But anytime you get a good group of guys out on the golf course, people you like to have conversations with, you got you just put all the worries away for four hours, focus on nothing but golf and interacting with your friends. Uh, secondly, I, I really enjoy playing pickleball up at Chicken and Pickle. Um, again, not that great at it. I think I probably am getting a lot better. Still got a long way to go get my butt kicked a lot that's just something relaxing about playing pickleball is just very enjoyable to me um like outdoor stuff too love going on hikes love just doing walking a trail riding a bike anything just to get out of the house get some fresh air and then obviously a lot of exercise being a professional basketball player um anything to do with exercise well, so speaking of uh, exercise and being outdoors, this is the first time, Garrett, I've ever seen you inside an indoor structure. So every interaction that we've ever had has been on a pickleball court uh, or doing something fun. So it's good to see you uh, in your natural habitat. Uh, sporting, and if you're not watching on YouTube, ladies and gentlemen, he's playing to the crowd. He's wearing his Fundamism and Charlie Hustle What's Good shirt. Uh, I didn't know we made shirts that big, brother. Uh, but speaking of custom made, I know that. <laughs> custom, speaking of custom made, uh, knowing that you enjoy playing golf, what's it like finding golf clubs for a seven foot tall gentleman? It was not easy. I actually had to custom make these ones in my garage a long, long time ago for high school golf. I uh, was on a golf team in high school. Clubs just were not fitting. And that's right about the time I grew from like 6'4", six, 6'5", six, to 7 foot in the course of a year. My golf game changed completely. So I had to get clubs to keep up with the, the amazing growth that I had. My dad, he's pretty handy. We took an old set of clubs, cut the shafts down, and made th- uh, the plus threes. But I've had the same clubs for probably 15 years now. I mean, it might be time to update. I agree. So... I'm learning so much more about you as our relationship progresses. So we connected uh, at Volley Llama last year, uh, benefiting Noah's Bandage Practice, Pediatric Cancer Research. I think I I, I met you one time before that on a pickleball court, but got the opportunity to meet you and and, uh, get a sense of where your heart lies and all that stuff. And you are, of course, a, a, a mountain of a man. Uh, but as I'm learning more about you, I find that you're very handy. So you and your father, uh, making golf clubs, I understand that you actually enjoy working on your own car. You got a a throwback classic car. What is this classic car? (laughs) Okay. Really do enjoy driving my car. Um, 
I, because I play basketball overseas, I'm only in the country usually for two, two and a half months a year. It's summertime, weather's nice. Wanted some type of old muscle car or convertible. Luckily, it took me a while, but I found one that was both. I drive a 1969 Cutlass Supreme convertible. Beautiful car, slowly, fi- was slowly fixing it up. Um, still enjoy working on it. The reason I didn't mention it earlier is because uh, incident that happened last summer, ever since then, I don't get a chance to work on it a whole lot anymore. I'd, uh, I'd rather pay people to work on it than potentially have an incident like I had a year ago. So, uh, of course, you're referencing your uh, one of a few brushes with death. And I just learned this yeah. about you, that you were laid up for a significant period of time after this uh, little yeah. mishap with your car. So, uh, so what's going on? You're changing some brake pads or something on this uh, 1969 Cutlass Supreme, and uh, all of a sudden, yeah. everything goes awry. Yeah, I am. I like to at least consider myself fairly handy. I'm not the best guy in the world, but I got a little bit of knowledge about cars, especially since I've had a few older cars. You know, every time you learn more and more. My driver's side brake just had a very slight squeak in it one day. Thought, all right, I need, to, you know, I need to check that out. Forgot about it. The next day, it's much louder. It's very noticeable. So I'm thinking, okay, I can, I can at least go through the basic checklist, make sure you know the brake, clean it real quick, make sure the the brake's getting fluid, make sure none of the lines are clogged. Uh, my parents don't have the best equipment at their house because I'm only in the country for two months a year. I just crash at my parents' house and travel a bunch, but they don't have the best equipment. That should have been my first red flag. I still try to do what I could. Um, their driveway is a little bit of an upslope, a slight hill. Uh, I put the front up, the front two tires up on the ramps, pull them up on ramps. Jack, I only have one jack. That's a big key to the story. I jack up the back axle, just right underneath the you know, center axles, jack it up, put blocks, put, pull the jack down, go around, bleed the brakes, clean them. They're, they're just, everything looks just fine. This is when I was like, okay, I'm kind of outmatched here. I did all the basics. I, this is as far as I can go with the equipment and a little bit of knowledge I have. Um, so I call a garage to uh, get, it in, you know, get an appointment for the next day. My father, we were supposed to do stuff the other day. He comes outside and he's talking to me about my schedule and making sure I didn't schedule over any of the other things that I um, was planning on doing. As we're talking, I walk around the back of the car, jack it up again, pull the blocks out. Oh, hang on, let me back up one second. In order to test the brakes, because I obviously I was bleeding them and make sure there's still pressure there, you got to start the car, be the back tires are off the ground. So you got to get them spinning and then hit the brakes. Because the last thing you want to do is unjack the car and you got no brakes and then you're just on a, a free ride down the hill. So I do that, everything was going fine. Uh, Father comes out, talking with him. I walk around the back of the car. I'm laying on my, because I only have one jack and it's right underneath the the rear axle, I'm laying down on my left side. I go to unjack it. Still don't know what happens. The car bounces and I guess bounce just past the lip of the front two ramps and just starts coming back on me. So it bounces once. The second time I feel it bounce on me. I immediately do the worst thing possible, start panicking. So uh, the way the rear end is, it's kind of at an angle. As I'm like here, I can still fit underneath the car long ways. As it's pushing me back, I go roll over to my back and do, I think, two and a half barrel rolls. So every time I roll to my back, I'm getting further and further underneath the car. Finally, my second time up, I'm wedged underneath the car. So this side, now I'm facing the exact, the complete opposite direction. This side and my arm are pinned underneath me. The car and the gas tank is on this side of me. I, um, I think my, I, I actually got stuck and that's what stopped the momentum of the car for a couple seconds. By this time, my father runs around the back and he's trying to push it up the, the hill. And that, He's not the fastest guy. So I was wedged for probably, I don't know, somewhere between five to 10 seconds. 
and I couldn't breathe. Um, they, this is an old, you know, 50 year old car. This thing's a couple thousand pounds. My dumb ass was thinking I'm the incredible Hulk to get out of this situation, but there's nothing to push against. So all I can do is go this way. But uh, I can just straight shoulder press this car off of me. Well, I couldn't breathe either. And when you can't breathe, like life or death for a couple seconds starts to kind of cross your mind. And I'm thinking at minimum, I'll at least be able to get the car off me where I can catch my breath. But the thing about life and death is when that happens and your mind goes to that, that place, your body reacts. So much adrenaline is going through my body that even though I'm a pretty strong guy, when you add all that adrenaline going, your muscles can lift so much more. What they, they stress that much and flex that, that much, but they can't go anywhere. They either tear in the middle of the muscle or they tear away from your attachments, whatever's holding your muscles there. That was, that's when I knew I was in trouble because I could feel a lot of pain there. And then I'm telling my dad, I can't, I, I've tried to push that car up the hill before when I've worked on it with other projects. If I could barely do it, I knew he wasn't going to be able to do it. I got lucky with a few things. First of all, my dad was even out there. Otherwise, I might still be stuck underneath the car. Secondly, when I did have to start it and get the back tires going, I left the keys in the front seat. So as I kind of get in the, a little bit better, you know, you know, I'm still stuck there, but I can at least breathe now. My brain slows down a little bit. I'm yelling at my dad, hey, the keys are in the front seat. Just go. Just get in the car and pull it off me so I can get out. Then I really, as he's running up to the front, I almost, the exhaust is cutting right across my body. So then I'm yelling at him again, like the second you start it, just go. I can buy a new car. I don't want to have to get reconstructive surgery or have this whole half of my body burnt up the rest of my life. The second you start it, go. So that's what he does. Luckily, he didn't crash anything. I, he pulls it off me. I kind of wiggle off the side of the driveway where there's a little bit of a shadow just to try to get out of the, the hot sun. And I'm sitting there for probably 10, 15 seconds, and I hear a voice over me that I didn't recognize. And they're like, Garrett, are you okay? Garrett. And I'm sitting there like, you know, coffin position. And I opened my eyes and I was like, I don't even know who this is. Turns out it's a neighbor of mine, three houses down. They were in their living room. Whenever the car first came, started to like come back on me, I yelled out, help, help, so loud. Three houses down inside their house, they heard me and just came outside and realized what was going on and then ran down to me. So, so look. I'm still alive. I can laugh at that now because how many people can say they ran over themselves with their own car? Or even were under a car and were thinking from a vanity perspective, gosh, I don't want to have burns on me for the rest of my life rather than, gosh, I hope I make it through this. <laughs> Dude, this is an incredible story. Uh, I've seen the car. It is absolutely gorgeous. You mentioned a couple of things. You were like, I was lucky. Uh, the yeah. keys were in it. My dad was outside. You know, all of these factors. And you, and you equate that to luck. So talk to us a little bit about uh, your idea of luck. Do you believe in luck? Are you more of a, an optimist versus a pep pessimist? How do you walk through life as it relates to the universe and luck and awesome stuff happening to you? Um, I definitely describe myself as a realistic optimist. Okay. I'm not one of those people that have their head in the clouds thinking every day is going to be sunshine and birds singing. That's just not going to happen. But I do think no matter what the situation is, you can find good in any situation. Even if it looks like it's a complete failure, there's still some things you can do as a person to grow from, to learn to grow from it. Uh, and secondly, the times I have caught myself focusing on the negative, it's a very slippery slope. Man. The second you start to go down that slope, it is a tough recovery. For so sure. I just think life is too short to try to, to try to waste any breath that you have. Luckily, I still have some breaths in my lungs. Um, every day, wake up, try to find something that you enjoy something that you can better yourself. 
man, I think that's, you know, one of the reasons amongst many that we, that we connect, or at least in my opinion, uh, is you are, or at least you seem outwardly to be a guy that d- doesn't get, uh, doesn't get rattled much, doesn't really get bogged down by the stuff that's not working. And so in that story, you know, referencing mm-hmm. the keys being in the car and your dad being around and, and, uh, you know, I find back to your point about, you know, life being a slippery slope, if you start thinking about all the crap that's not working, I mean, you could see whatever you want to see in this world. There's bad things like you referenced that happens yeah. to everybody. And so realizing that this too shall pass and that, that life is short uh, and you could learn from any experience obviously mm-hmm. can help us get through to the next day. So the question of the hour, what did you learn from said experience? What did you learn from getting run over? Uh Proper preparation is everything. (laughs) If I had a little bit better equipment or if I trusted myself a little bit more, I probably would not have put myself in that situation. Me being a little bit younger, a little bit more naive. uh, I just thought, yeah, this looks safe. It looks good. Why not try it? When I should have probably covered my grounds and knew uh, if I'm not prepared or don't have the proper preparation, probably shouldn't try to execute this plan. I Uh, love that at the age of uh, probably 29, I'm guessing. No, you're 30. 30, 30, Yes. Yeah. You're 30 now. 30 right now. But you were 29 when you got ran over by the car, right? That's correct. Yeah. 29 and all your years of uh, professional basketball, organized basketball, uh, schooling, uh, being a, a, a proud family member, preparation just hits you like a ton of bricks at the age of 29. So let's talk about, uh, let's talk about your journey. You are a professional basketball player. So, uh, in Japan, is that accurate? Yep. Been, uh, Japan the last three seasons, just signed to go back to Japan, did five years in Europe before that. And then a little stint in America with the Celtics G league team. Well, so first of all, congratulations on the re-signing. I know that's uh, that's big Thank time, you. super exciting. It is your career. It's how you make money. Mm-hmm. It's also basically defined your professional existence uh, for probably as long as you could remember. Even in high school, you mentioned that you went from six foot four to seven foot in a hurry. Uh, talk to us yeah. about that transition in your body style and specifically like I know the taller you get, sometimes you get uh, a little less coordinated. And when you grow that fast in high school, did it take you a time to kind of grow into your body and figure out how to make yourself work? Yeah, absolutely. It was a really big change. Uh, The start of my junior year, going into basketball season, kind of start of the school year, uh, I was about 6'4". And we were thinking I was probably going to be the point guard for our team that year. I was going to a very small Christian school. Okay. By Christmas, I'm about 6'7", six, 6'8", six, playing more of a small forward wing type role. And then by the end of the basketball season and end of the school year, I'm 6'11", playing a lot more closer to the rim. Uh, so I, I was able to develop a lot of guard skills and a lot of ball handling, a lot of perimeter stuff and court vision because I grew up more perimeter and growing to such uh, extreme height, I guess you could say, uh, I had to learn, quickly learn all the back to the basket stuff, all the low post, mid post um, things too. So even going into my first year of college, I had only been playing back to the basket for a few years when really I was, I still felt more comfortable on the perimeter. I just kept growing and growing. I know in the introduction you said I was 255, that was probably my college weight, a little bit bigger than that now. Um, but yeah, I just every I pulled year, that straight from Wikipedia. Uh, that's fine. <laughs> and everything um, you read on the internet is true, buddy. Oh yeah, that's one of the rules of life. <laughs> so, so every year in pro ball, just keep uh, adjusting to every situation. Some teams you're on, uh, you have completely different roles with every every situation. Some teams I knew I'm only going to play 10 to 12 minutes because that's what they do. They, they go 12 guys deep. Everyone has a short amount of playing time. This is your role. Uh, in Japan, it's the exact opposite. You only get two Americans. Um, so those hey, two Americans. You only get two Americans like they cap it at two? Yeah, you get three on it per team. Only two can be on the court together. Uh, last year, only one guy was just in street clothes behind the bench. 
So their teams were paying somebody to basically be a practice player. What? This year, they're allowing all three guys to play, but only two can be on a court at, at a time. That, I, that's discriminatory. Like, what? why are they hating against Americans? <laughs> well, I you're think so they're, they're doing good. it. The, the concept behind it is it's a great concept, and I do think it's helped their country some, is it forces Japanese guys to be on the court. Mm. Have to have at least three domestic players. And if you're going to put them with two Americans, the idea is that it's slowly going to raise Japanese basketball when other countries like Germany, that they very rarely limit Americans. Or you can have five Americans on the court. There's a lot of times that happens. And German guys only end up playing 10, 20% of the game. Well, that's not doing their country a favor by having their best players sit on the bench over foreigners. Man. So like Japan's doing it. Uh, in the short term, it, I do think it's going to hurt that or hurt the overall state of the league because it could be better because they do have a lot of money and they could pull in more imports. In the long run for actual Japanese guys, I think it will be better. Man, what's brilliant about that, so I would have never, never thought about the rationale behind why to limit uh, yeah. the American players. And that is brilliant. Uh, also brilliant is the fact that you consider yourself an import, and that is now your new nickname to me. Uh, yeah, it sounds sounds good, right? Yeah, it sounds super good. Uh, well, as soon as I went overseas, I just kept saying foreigners. They don't use that word. Everyone calls us imports. Oh, really? To make it one step better, the European Union has an actual athlete, like athlete visa. Japan doesn't. So basketball players or any type of athlete goes over there under an entertainer visa. So I'm a import entertainer over there. That's so exotic now, right? Dude, I bet you you clean up as an import entertainer in whatever you choose to do. Uh, seven foot, I'm sure that that would bring a lot of eyes, a lot of eyes, import entertainer. So oh, yeah. talk to us about, uh, you mentioned when you went to college uh, mm -hmm. and not necessarily playing a lot of the low post, were you recruited as a big man? I was. Uh, my college experience was a little bit unique because I, I went to that small Christian school, didn't really travel, play any tournaments a whole lot during the summer until my junior and senior year. And then it blew up. I went to my first national tournament within probably two weeks. I had over 20 scholarship offers. By the end of the summer, I heard from almost every school in the country and had to really narrow it down quickly because the first signing period was only a few months away. So I went and took a, a bunch of different college visits. Every team talked to me about something different. Again, it's finding that role that I felt comfortable with or with the coaching staff that I felt comfortable with. Uh, that played a big factor into my decision. Did you talk to the Jayhawks? I did. I talked to Danny Manning. Yeah, and Bill what? And, yeah. here you, and here you are. You have regrets, significant regrets, don't you? Uh, I do not have any. <laughs> I, even just, I know you're a big KU guy, so that's why I got the talk going. No, you know, I, obviously I am a KU guy. I didn't go to KU. I actually went to UMKC, which is affiliated with Missouri. So if anybody wanted to press on me, they could very easily. Uh, everybody in my family graduated from KU. You know how that works when you just, you're kind of, you're raised you're born a fan uh, yeah. and it never quits. So uh, yeah. I did have the opportunity to go to a uh, Wichita State game. Unfortunately, you weren't there. I think you were overseas. But uh, Kelly Aldridge, our close personal friend from Chicken and Pickle, yeah. and uh, Dave Johnson and team took us out there. And it was, a, it was a tremendous experience. I know your fan base is second to none down there. Great Wichita atmosphere. Coke Arena, one of the best. They don't, so, so they don't have much to, to, to watch or root for outside of the Wichita State uh, athletics team. Is that an accurate assessment? Yeah, there's some small minor league teams in Wichita, but for the most part, the entire city is based or is at least big fans of Wichita State basketball, volleyball, softball, baseball, all the sports. Hmm. So I want to talk a little bit about your transition into professional ball uh, and, mm -hmm. and, and potentially even the draft. But I know your senior year, you really came into your own. You were a yeah. first team all Missouri Valley Conference uh, doing the day thing and uh, uh, establishing yourself as a dominant force in life. Uh, 
talk to us about your your thought process of next steps. Did you know that professional basketball was in the cards for you? What were your hopes? Uh, was the NBA a a a valid route for you potentially? Growing up, of course, it's always in the back of your mind. You know, you want to be a professional basketball player at the highest level. The highest level is definitely the NBA. Uh, I would say my basketball journey went more, my mindset went more in stages. At first, when in high school, it was just compete to be the best high school player I could be. I went to that small Christian school, so I didn't have a ton of competition there. But as soon as I went to a, a bigger AAU program, that's when it was, how can I get to the, at first I wasn't on the top team. I had to work my way up and get to the top team. Then as soon as I got there, it was, how can I become the best player and raise the level of this team? And then it became, well, how can I get to the highest level college I, I can get to? How can I get to where I have my choice of any college I want instead of a smaller, you know, a smaller pool of colleges that want me? Then as soon as I got to college, it was, how can we get to the NCAA tournament? which had only been there I think one time in like 30 years is when Paul Miller led him to the sweet 16. So that was my goal was how can we become a better team? How can I better this, this whole situation in the locker room, off the court, uh, in, like even in the classroom, in the community. And then how can I get us to the NCAA tournament? Cause ultimately that was my goal. And then after the NCAA tournaments, how far can we advance? Can we win a national championship? Uh, but it wasn't until after my college career was over that I truly thought about professional basketball. Even when I was in college, there were situations you could have, I could have showed myself more or done other things to make myself stand out, but I didn't feel like that benefited the team as much as if I play my role to the best that I can be and be a leader for the team. Yeah. So the whole time in college, I never talked to a single agent, never talked to any pro pro um, scouts, no, not a single team. I left that up. So uh, I, I trusted my parents. I have a great family and great support system around me. And then I trusted one or two of my coaches I grew up with. I let them handle all that. I talked to them and said, I don't need the distraction. Like I didn't even have social media in college. I just, I don't want any of that distraction. I have my goals in mind. You guys feel free to talk to them. Feel free to take, talk to as many people as you want. Don't do anything illegal because I know there's a lot of people have been caught in situations like that when they tell their family, do what you want. And then the family will take advantage for, you know, we'll keep their interest in mind and not the athlete's interest in mind. I feel so, like you're, I you're, feel like you're knocking KU right now. Is that what's going on? Is that what's? No, there wasn't, there was not I just, a general blank statement. Okay. <laughs> so what happened was they narrowed down to about the top 10 that they really liked. We lost in the NCAA tournament on, I think, I think it was a Thursday night. Friday, we flew back to Wichita, Friday morning. And that's whenever I first, after we lost, I went out to dinner with Dave Johnson and my family. Um, and that's when we sat down and I said, okay, where are we at? My college career is over. It's gone. Nothing I can do about that now. I did. I felt like I did the best I could. I did everything I could. Unfortunately, it didn't end the way I wanted it to, but how can I go? What's the next step now? I met, I think eight of the 10 people, eight of the 10 agents flew in that weekend. I went back to Wichita Friday morning, drove back to KC Friday night, eight of the 10 agents flew in that weekend. Then I interviewed them all, narrowed down to my top two or three, and then really, you know, dove into those, the, what's the agent like, what's the company like, what's their history, who are they representing now, where, where does that company want to be in the future? Then I even flew to, they, a couple of companies flew me out to see their headquarters and meet with their whole team, their marketing team, all that, social media, everybody. And then I chose um, Sean Kennedy with Excel Sports Management uh, out of New York. They have offices in New York, D.C., and L.A. Uh, been with him ever since. Great guy. Talk with him all the time. Really, really happy with my decision. So that was in 2012, is that? 2012, yeah. So... You do you enter your name in the draft then? Obviously, yes. So after I chose uh, Sean Kennedy, and every every agent has their different workout spots where they send all their guys. We went to one of the best in the country. Um, it's up in 
where they have two locations. I think one's in Philly and one is in New York, just up um, in um, what is it, Mineola, I think, and up on Long Island. It's called Pro Hoops. Uh, Jay Hernandez is, does a great job. He's worked with tons and tons of athletes. He specializes in basketball. Uh, my workout partner was Myers Leonard. He's having a great career. Mm. Jeremy Lamb, uh, my roommate was Jeremy Lamb. And then the other, because they don't want you to room with your workout partner because there's so much conflict and competition during workouts. They don't want you to see each other all the time. So I worked out with Myers. Jeremy Lamb was my roommate. And then um, uh, Myers' roommate was um, Chris Middleton. Mm. So three really big names. Yeah. with unfortunately when i was up there i had a really bad injury that slowed my career down quite a bit uh so i didn't pan out like those guys panned out but i still i tried to overcome my injury try to rehab it the best i could and then still had a pretty successful career overseas would you run yourself over with a car or something (laughs) close this one uh wasn't as close to death but Probably a worse injury in the in the long run. Was it a basketball related injury or something that you did personally? Yeah, I tore my quad pretty bad. Yikes! I was back. It was my last workout before I was coming back to walk at graduation. I remember that because that, that affected my mindset some. We, I had I think it was ten sprints at the end of the workout. And like the sixth one, I really felt my quad tighten up. But I'm thinking I got just three, four more sprints. I got the weekend off. I'm flying back to walk in graduation, see all my friends. Like, just don't be a wuss. Power through. Not but two steps in my next rep. I start somersaulting on the ground. And my, my trainer started laughing because he just thought I tripped. Yeah. I didn't get up. That's when he walked over to me and he was like, all right, what's going on? And I was like, I feel like someone just stabbed me with a knife in my quad. So he shut the workout down. Went, uh, I went back and packed up my things that night. Went the next morning and saw a physical therapist um, just to see how bad it might potentially be. I also saw a doctor and got an MRI the next morning. They told me my quads torn. Took the weekend off. Came back to uh, flew back to New York to see try to really assess the damage. Saw some of the pro teams doctors up there. This is another decision I made when I was young and stupid. Um, all these NBA teams were telling me we want to draft you. We want to see you healthy. We want to see you in person. I had, I believe it was like 24 or 25 workouts lined up over, over the course of like 31 days. The NBA is a little different. You got to fly from city to city. It's not quite like the NFL where everyone goes to Indianapolis or all the teams come to your college for a pro day. Mm -hmm. The the NBA is, I really liked it. I love that time because I love to travel and see all the different cities, all the different organizations. But we had to scale back from like, I think it was 25. I ended up only doing like 15 or 16. Um, but to do that, uh, the doctor said, you can take a cortisone shot and you'll, I didn't know everything that was bad about cortisone at that time. Right. Just, I can, I can mask your injury and then rehab it right later. Mm. Terrible decision. Terrible. Uh, cortisone is great for joints. If it touches soft tissue, it just kills it. Really? So to get it right in like the belly of my quad, even today, the top third of my quad is pretty much just gone. It's just one big ligament or tendon. It's no longer really a muscle because I took that cortisone shot. That's why you didn't get any W's on that pickleball court last week. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it still affects me today. I do the best I can to rehab it. I did end up tearing it a second time overseas. Hmm. And that's when I shut it down and had to come back to, um, I went to a facility out in Phoenix and rehab for about six months. But that's, that's another injury that has another, I'm not gonna say it, it was, it's terrible. It was another obstacle I had to overcome. For sure. And made you stronger as a result. Well, yeah. I, I wanna talk to you, uh, obviously, as we continue down your professional journey, but for the Fundamism Podcast listeners, Uh, Garrett said a couple of really impactful things that I think that we could all pull out of this episode. Um, So you said growing up, of course, the NBA is the ultimate goal. Everybody wants to be there. 
And, you know, if you're, if you're working in an organization, maybe you want to be a CEO, you know, maybe you want to get promoted, maybe you, whatever your goals are, we typically shoot for the stars, right? Which is great. It's a great to have an ultimate desired outcome, an ultimate goal. But I love how you broke it down, Garrett, and that you had very short term goals. Like, how could I, how could I make the team? How could I uh, make the NCAA tournament for the first time? How could I be the best possible role player for my team and side note set aside your ego like that is so huge to me knowing that you could have done more things to showcase your talents you could have you know taken more shots or demanded the ball in the paint or whatever it may be it may have been you could have done more to boost your ego uh, and potentially boost your your stock but you didn't you did what's right for the team and as a result I would argue that um you're recognized very much as a, a genuine dude, a team player, and that's probably equated to some of the success in your career. So you mentioned that uh, you played for the, uh, the Celtics G League affiliate. Was that yeah. immediately out of, uh, out of college after you nursed back the, uh, the quad injury? My first two months, I went over to Seoul, South Korea. I uh, tried to play on my quad. Terrible idea. That's where I tore it a second time. Because I took that cortisone shot and because I didn't rehab it correctly, as soon as I went overseas, it pretty much retore very quickly. That's one situation I wasn't the craziest about with the way the team handled it, the team doctors handled it. It was also my first experience overseas. So going through that process, I learned a lot. I made sure to never repeat the same mistakes that I did the first time. Came back to Phoenix, rehab for about six months, and then did the G League for the last two to three months of the season. Mm. Um, met some great guys, got a completely new understanding and just a lot more information on how the G League and NBA and all that works. Really like my coach there, Mike Taylor. Uh, he coaches over, he's back overseas now, but he's been the coach of the Polish national team for a long time. Really, really great guy, solid coach. Um, he's another guy I've kept in touch with. Would love to play for him one day. Our paths just haven't got a chance to cross again. So that begs a good question. Obviously, uh, for an individual like you that's constantly looking to improve and, and excel uh, and be the best that you can possibly be in whatever you choose to do, there's been a lot of folks in your life, the Mike Taylors of the world, that have helped uh, develop you know, certain traits in you or gave you mm -hmm. uh, guidance when you needed uh, who who has been outside of Mike Taylor? Who have been some of the most significant leaders in your life? Family is very big with me. My parents, I thought, did a great job raising me. I have two older brothers, one younger sister. Um, all of us together, you know, growing up, the, the dynamic shifts when you're from the time we were younger to when we're adults, and now even when now they have they all have family and kids, so to stay as close as we have throughout that dynamic family would still be the number one thing for me. Outside of that, I played for Greg Marshall in college, still keep in touch with him quite a bit. He, I consider him family. Um, Dave Johnson, the owner at chicken and pickle and Max's property. I grew up with his son, Corey for a long time, just playing, playing basketball. Um, for a long time, I had no idea. I hear just Corey's dad to me. I had no idea about his, the incredible business mind and entrepreneurial and work ethic that he had. As I went to college and as I started to think also, you know, I can't play basketball forever. That's when I got more interested in what is it that he does that makes him so successful hmm. and is really taking me under his wing. Another guy that I consider family. Uh, growing up, I did, I had a really good church family around me and um, church network around me. After I moved away from the east side of Kansas City, it's been tougher to keep in touch with those people, uh, and especially now living overseas for 10 months a year. To get plugged into a church here has been a little bit tougher because I'm only in the country for two months. Sure. That's something I would definitely like to pursue in the future whenever I do set roots down is get that good church atmosphere and that network and accountability system around me again. But growing up, yeah, guys like Jeremy Williams, Jimmy Armstrong, and Adam Truax, uh, those three made a very big impact in my life. And then the pastor was Joey Butler at the time, 
unfortunately he passed away of cancer a few years ago, but Gateway Church in Blue Springs did some amazing things to uh, advance me as a person and personally and my faith life. Well, I can tell that structure and faith uh, relationships, connection, those are all things that are very powerful uh, and, and uh, guiding principles for you in life. Uh, which again marries nicely to the fundamentalism principle. You know, the more I hear um, Dave Johnson, hear about him and experience him, the more I feel like I want more of him in my life. You know, uh, he's one of those uh, individuals that you mentioned. He's just got a brilliant mind, uh, but is yeah. so freaking nice and so present in understanding the power of a relationship. Um, it reinforces the fact that uh, there are great people out there so long as you're, if, if your, your eyes are open and you're paying close attention. So, all right, four years in Europe, three years in Japan. I'm sure you've got some crazy overseas stories. Oh, what yeah. Are some of the things that jump out at you in your experience overseas. Well, I've been very blessed to play in some great cities. I have friends that have had 10, 12, 15 year careers overseas. And they've only got to play in a good city for one or two of those years. My time in Europe and even my time in Asia, I've been very blessed to play in some great cities. Prague was beautiful. I uh, really enjoyed Central Europe. It was pretty much untouched by the war, so it's very well preserved. Uh, I like a lot of the, just the culture and the things that the people of Czech do. Went to Minsk after that. Uh, it's, it's, it's Belarus, but it's basically Russia. Mm -hmm. Russia controls them. Has uh, in and out of Russia for two years, because even when I played in Prague, we would play um, VTB, which is the best of Eastern Europe. And when you talk Eastern Europe, Russia has a lot of the best teams. Russia is a whole different animal. Uh, that is a completely, it's almost like a, it's hard to describe unless you get there. Because Europe, you have so many places that are, just they fall in line with the, the European lifestyle. Russia really is its own entity. Um, and that, I had another crazy experience in Russia too, flying back one day. Give we it played, to me. I forget which, which city we played in, maybe Kuban or Kazan. We got to fly through uh, Moscow. You either fly through Moscow or St. Petersburg anytime you want to go back to the European Union. So we fly, we're going to Moscow. Uh, most of their terminals, you got to take a bus out to the plane. If I don't have an exit row, I just kind of linger around, let everyone get on the plane. And then if I'm the last one there, I just sit down in any open chair that's available. Most of the time, the flight attendant, they don't care because everybody else is on the plane, right? There's no one to complain. So why, why would they make a big deal of it? Well, I'm really trying hard to let this guy go and get on the plane. He's not having it. I try to speak English. He just brushes me off. I try to speak the very little bit of Russian I knew at that time. I've lost all of it. Still not having it. So I was like, all right, whatever. I'll just get on the plane. Uh, I walk up the aisle or wa walking down the aisle, both um, aisle seats of the exit row are open and both I have teammates on the window seats and there's people in the middle. I put my computer down, my headphones. I start to put my bag up top. He, the guy behind me walks up and just moves my computer. Doesn't say a word to me. Picks it up, puts it on the other side. Again, I'm, I don't want to make a big deal of anything. There's two seats open, fine. I'll just put my headphones on, start listening to music. Usually, because I'm the last one on the plane, we take off pretty quickly. Well, this is 15 minutes later. We still haven't moved. I see all the flight attendants up front talking back and forth. And I'm like, all right, this is, this is a little weird. Next thing you know, four cops walk up like four big Russian cops. They, uh, they get on the plane. They're looking at all the seat numbers. They walk down the aisle. They look at me. They look at him. They say some stuff to him in Russian. All four cops are surrounded. They don't like just, you know, in America, you just ask them, hey, can you step up front? Or like, can you, you want to come outside the plane and we'll talk? These guys like aggressively are grabbing his arms and just haul him off the plane. What? What the heck just happened? Yeah. Three, four minutes later, uh, a couple like, I don't know, engineers or technicians or someone comes on the plane. They start tearing his chair apart. Like they start inspecting everything, taking off the cushions, all that. So me and my teammates that are there are just watching this and we're like, 
are we in danger right now? What is going on? They ask us, they have a translator come in, they ask us, did he touch anything? Did he look through anyone's bags? Did he have a bag overhead? I didn't want to lose my computer or anything. <laughs> he just sat down, that was it. <laughs> hey, if this plane goes down, at least I got my computer though. <laughs> yeah. So I even, I had texted my parents and it was a good thing that my text didn't go through because they were probably worried about me the whole flight. But I just texted on my flight number and I was like, a crazy situation happened. I'll explain it whenever I can get a chance to talk to you. But here's my flight number, Moscow to Minsk. Flight, well, they get off the plane, flight leaves, no problem. We land, no problem. As we're waiting, you know, the we taxi up to the gate. As we're waiting there, um, I walk up. I'm one of the first people off the plane, so I walk up right by the flight attendants. I try to have a conversation with them about, hey, the guy that was pulled off the plane, like, why? They talk back and forth in Russian, two, three sentences. They just look at me, and they, the only English that they really could say was, he's very bad, bad man. Oh. I just thought, oh, okay, that's all I'm going to get. <laughs> so like, I checked the papers the next couple of days, nothing about it. Never figured out who the guy was. But in Russia, I mean, you can you can get made fun of for anything. If you have yeah. an anti-Putin sign, you're considered a bad person. True. So I don't know which level of degree, he, how bad he was. It was just another instance that I was like, that's something you very few people get to experience. Uh, one funny thing was right after they left, the technicians left before we take off, one of my teammates that was sitting out in the aisle, he just locks, he like, he locks eyes with me stands up and he goes nope not today i ain't dying today and <laughs> back to the plane <laughs> and i was like if he got a bomb in this plane we're all going down oh my gosh and that. now we'll never know garrett i don't know what it's like being on that plane and never now because i know that i'm just gonna wonder from now on every time i see you yeah. what was the dude on the plane doing forever i don't know it was an <laughs> old guy too like if Honestly, I would never have thought this guy's a threat to my life right now. Probably mid sixties, look just like your average average Joe. It makes me wonder why he was uh, peacocking on you. Why why he wanted that seat so bad? I don't know. Man, he probably you know you're you're that seven footer that uh, all the insecure people run up to and they try to start beef with because if you find the biggest guy in prison or in the bar. <laughs> and swell up on them, it makes you look better. That's yes, what I think. That is cool. something, especially overseas, I'm always a little bit cautious of. Like, I, mean, I just, I avoid conflict by nature. I think yes. there's, there's so many better ways to solve things than fighting, but everybody wants to knock out the big guy. <laughs> then when some other people are fighting, and like, I'll go to try to break it up, my head's got to be on a swivel because everyone wants that YouTube moment of knocking out the giant. <laughs> Which begs the question, every time I think of a seven-footer playing basketball, I think of the time that Vince Carter dunked on that dude in the Olympics. Have you yeah. ever been dunked on, Garrett? Oh, all the time. <laughs> if you play at a high enough level, everybody gets dunked on all the time. I mean, I play at a pretty high level. I've never been dunked on. Well, that's because we've never played together. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh... As we start to come this, uh, bring this thing to a close, uh, you're an individual that, for one reason or the other, finds you in, for yourself in precarious situations. Uh, you mm -hmm. mentioned the time that your car got uh, uh, moved off the, the, the jack or whatever and you got ran over. That was your second time uh, of a brush with death. Talk to us yeah. about the first. Okay. The car instance happened so quick. That was, I mean, it's extremely scary looking back at it. I'm very happy I lived through it. This next one is probably the closest I've ever actually been to death. My, I don't know, this is probably a six year pro ball. Um, I signed to play in Barcelona with a team called Juventut. They played at the, a cool fact was they play at the um, Olympic Arena in Barcelona where the dream team played. Yeah. That was the arena. That's where we practice. I fly over there late, uh, I think it was like mid to late August, crazy hot out. So, I mean, we're talking close to 100 degrees every day, humid, no AC in the gym. Get there and I go through my medical testing, everything's fine. We did a uh, practice in the morning. Uh, I'm sorry, I practice at night, practice in the morning, practice at night. 
bam, 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 three plus hours, all three of them. By the end of the third practice, we go to bring it up. And, you know, you clinch your fists. We all put our fists in the air. Uh, we, we say our little team motto. We break. And I remember looking at my fists, and I was like, it's stuck there. Like, my muscles are just twitching, but I'm, my brain's telling it to open. It's not opening. So I walk over the trainer and I was like, man, like I, I'm extremely dehydrated. I already knew that. And I was just like, hey, something's not right. Like I, I can't, like I'm not even moving. Like my motor functions aren't even really going. So he says, okay, sit down on the floor. Um, I'm going to stretch you out. Let's try to get you to recover as fast as you can. And we'll get you hydrated. As soon as I sit down on the floor, cramping like crazy. It's hamstrings that as soon as I like lean forward to do my hand, to, like to stretch my hamstring, my back's cramping up. As soon as my back cramps up, shoulders, quads, everything. So at that time, our team doctor comes over to me and he's telling me, I, I got to try to find a way to hydrate and we got to find a way to cool my lower, my, my core temperature. And he's telling me there's a chance that this is a beginning of a heat stroke. So I was like, all right, that doesn't sound good. So... <laughs> We get, uh, they put together an ice bath in our locker room for me, which is common. I do them all the time. I have two teammates help me into the ice bath because at this point, every time I try to walk, literally any movement, something on my body is cramping. They get me in the ice bath. I do them all the time. I know what they're supposed to feel like. 15 minutes later, I'm sitting in a pool of ice, still just sweating. Cannot get my core temperature lower. And I remember as I had teammates help me out of the ice bath, I remember asking him, I was like, this is seen, this seems like it's pretty serious at this point. Like maybe I should go to the hospital, like get two IVs in my arm, try to hydrate. He says, no, uh, if you hydrate naturally, it, it'll help your body recover a lot faster. I found out later on doing my own research, that's not true at all. <laughs> Those IVs are there for a reason. Doctors most of the time know what they're doing. You can hydrate a lot faster through an IV. We go back, they told, and then he tells me, we already contacted the chef at the hotel. Like, your dinners are prepared. We're sending you back with a, a case of Gatorade, Powerade, all that. Um, and then tomorrow you're taking off. You got you to gotta get your body hydrated, get feeling normal again. Had to have teammates help me out to the car. Still couldn't walk. Had to have our translator help me up to my hotel room. I'm sitting in the bed in the hotel room, just laying on my back. Had to, I couldn't grip a, a fork or a knife. I still didn't have all my motor functions. Had to be, as I was probably 25, 26 at the time, very humbling to have to be spoon fed because I can't, I couldn't even eat my own food. And uh, so that was very humbling. They rig up two big power aids next to me so I can lay in bed and all I gotta do is just turn my head to one side or the other to drink. Like, like I'm like a guinea pig or something. Uh, when you get that dehydrated, your body just rejects everything. So they don't have IVs over there or what? The doctor is just against getting me. I don't, I still don't know why. Interesting. Uh, so the translator feeds me, he rigs those up. He, he eventually leaves. Cause at this point it's like 1am in the morning. I remember sitting on my bed. The next thing I know, I wake up. The room's pitch black. Before he left, it was like, you know, he blacked out cur the blackout curtains, all that. I wake up, pitch black room, body is still hurting, aching. I can tell like I'm not in my bed anymore. Like the, the ground's hard beneath me. Don't know, my memory wasn't there. Don't know where I am at this point. I start to, immediately I do the worst thing possible again, start to panic. I go back into a full on sweat. I try to yell for help. I can't, my, my tongue starts cramping up. Didn't even know that that was possible. My tongue and jaw start cramping up. So I'm, in my mind, I'm trying to yell for help. Really, I'm probably like barely whispering. And every time I try to move something, I start cramping again. So like I could tell I'm not restrained, but I'm, it felt like I was restrained. So I start panicking, freaking out. Probably good 20 to 25 seconds. And then my memory starts to come back to me. I was like, okay, I flew to Barcelona a couple of days ago. I went through practices. I was having some health issues. And as it starts coming back to me, I start to remember like, okay, I, I got to still be in my hotel room. So I'm able to find one of the, like slowly kind of army crawl over the wall, find a light switch and turn it on. I was like, okay, I'm for sure in my hotel room. 
how did I get on the floor? And the only thing I can think of is I, I probably got up to go to the bathroom because like I said, you, you re your body rejects everything you try to put in it. Um, I'm assuming I made it to the bathroom. And as I started to walk back to my bed, I must've just passed out, fell backwards and hit my head. Oh, jeez! didn't make it to the bathroom yet. When you pass out, you know, everything relaxes. I probably would have went all over myself. Sure. At least I'm assuming I made it to the bathroom okay. Then I passed out. The whole rest of the night could not could not sleep at all. Because I was legit thinking, like, I mean, you hear about all the time with athletes, guys die of heat strokes because of extreme dehydration. Right. Thinking, like, if I fall asleep, I could never wake up. So all night, just terrible night. Had some of the craziest thoughts in my mind. The next day, did literally nothing besides drink the entire day, probably five gallons of water and Powerade. Then the team wanted me to practice the next day. That was a terrible choice because when everything cramps up and you don't have a way to stretch it or release it, you're basically just straining all your muscles. Right. So you're a grade one, grade two strain of your entire body. That, that took me a, a good probably – six to eight weeks before I actually felt normal again because I didn't I couldn't I didn't have the time I was I was also afraid of getting cut um to actually you know take a couple days off or let my body actually recover and even today it still affects me I was always a sweater before the heat stroke it is a whole nother level now like as you've seen on the pickleball court I mean I can wring my shirt headband out and it's just puddles and puddles keeps you lean uh, sometimes, <laughs> <laughs> but then you go and you have that chicken sandwich or the, the, uh, burnt ends that you told me about the other day, which were fire. Yeah. So they, some good food there. they do have some great food, some great people, most importantly. Um, so as we start to wrap this thing up, I know that you're patiently awaiting, obviously you've been uh, significantly impact like the bulk of society with the pandemic and the coronavirus. Yeah. And so uh, you got re-signed and you're just patiently awaiting uh, them to say, uh, potentially maybe you have a, an entertainment uh, uh, exception uh, to go overseas and, and to hoop yeah. again. What's the story? Where are you currently at? Yeah, signed with a great club, Osaka, second biggest city in Japan. It's about 15 to 20 million people based on what suburbs you include in that. Um, top division team, one of the best in the league. My contract starts August 1st. We don't know when the borders will officially open up. I don't think I'm going to be able to wait until they truly open the borders up. I think the league is working with the government to try to get exceptions for basketball guys because soccer and baseball, they're two other main sports. Those guys are already in the country. Mm -hmm. their, their season was just starting when all this happened. So they stayed in the country anticipating – well, you know, in four weeks and six weeks, they'll be able to continue their season. Our season got canceled. We all came home for the off season. And now we're all trying to go back over for the new season. And that's the problem we're having is getting back in the country. I think our best bet is, like I said, they'll work with the government or politicians to get some type of special exemption for entertainers. And at that point, we'll go through a 10 to 14 day quarantine and then join up with the, with the teams. Well, listen, man, uh, I'm rooting for you. I hope it opens up relatively soon. Uh, selfishly, I'm going to miss you on that pickleball court. This might be the last time I see you before you uh, go overseas and dominate once again. But I know our paths will cross. One thing that I'm really trying to do with the Fundamism podcast as we start to wrap up is provide mm -hmm. folks with some tactical things that they could do to help improve their quality of life. And while I wouldn't task you with that goal, um, you're an individual that have seen some level of sustained success. Uh, I don't know what the average uh, career of a professional basketball player is, but I know in football or the NFL, it's like two and a half years, or maybe it's one and a half. Kunal was telling me. Yeah. For, Whatever it is, it's very for basketball. Good. It's one and a half years. One and a half years. So here we are coming up on, you know, year nine or 10 for you. What year can you nine, attribute? Yeah. What, year nine. What could you attribute your success to in? If you think about how somebody could recreate sustained sustain success in whatever they do, what could you attribute yours to? Faith is still the number one thing in my life. Um, faith in a higher power. Uh, for me, it's God. For me, I believe in the Trinity. You know, 
Uh, I believe that I was put on this earth for a different reason. Uh, most people, a lot of people just look at earthly things and they're only trying to accumulate wealth or they're only trying to find the, the perfect person to marry, whatever it is. Um, I think perspective, because of my faith, I have perspective. Mm-hmm. This is all temporary. It, just like scripture says, live in the world, but not of the world. Mm-hmm. Every trial I go through, keeping that positive mindset, that realistic optimism, that is all rooted in my faith. And the other thing, actually, I just heard it during my warm up today because um, our trainer was playing some motivational stuff. Uh, keeping with that same realistic optimist uh, mindset is you have to have that voice in your head that you're being honest and real with yourself, but you're also being positive because there's a lot of times you're going to go through in life. The only positive voice you're going to hear is your own. There's so many, so much negativity and so many people out there that want to tear you down. You're going to hear all that outwardly and inwardly that has to translate to how can I better myself? How can I improve other people's lives? And how can I make an impact to the people around me? Mm. You, and if you just try to focus on those three different aspects, and, and for me, again, all, all three of those aspects are rooted in my faith and in the Lord Jesus, that the joy and the happiness and just, it's a whole nother level that you get to experience. For sure. Well, listen, joy, fun, and fulfillment, uh, equality for all. That's what we're all about with fundamentalism. So we greatly appreciate you being on. Uh, Garrett, obviously, faith, having faith in something, uh, perspective. Mm-hmm. I, love, I love this uh, being living in this world, but not of it. I love that. Yeah. And then uh, being realistically optimistic and being the best voice around you because there's a lot of negativity. And so you got to be a, your own cheerleader. You got to believe in yourself. So from the bottom of my heart, man, I greatly appreciate you coming on. I know this has been a long time coming. I wish you safe travels. If, if anybody wants to learn more about Garrett Stutz, where do we go? I know that you're not big on social media. I'm not big on social media. Um, anyone that's close to me, I would say just call me up and let's go play <laughs> Oh, that's just, we'll, we'll find time to connect. If you don't know me, I am on Facebook. There's some fake profiles out there of me, but the real one is me with um, my hair is all blown out. It doesn't look like me at all. And I got like a brave heart face paint going on. Click on that. Send me a message. Love to network. Love to connect with people. Let me know. How can I help you? Thanks, Garrett. You're an absolute G. To the Fun of Is a Podcast listener, we couldn't be what we are without you. We greatly appreciate your support. Live to the fullest by gravitating more towards what gives you strength as opposed to what doesn't. In doing so, go out and have some fun today and create some fun in the lives of others. Until we see you on the flip side, deuces!